Los Angeles freak scene, Zappa didn't so much have to search for the right artists to document on his label, but instead simply wait for them to turn up. With Wildman Fisher already on the books, the next act to fascinate him was a group of dancers, already established on the downtown scene, who would, over time, become the GTOs. I was a dancer with a troop of girls, and we were calling ourselves the Laurel Canyon Ballet Company. And we were dancing with a, a lot of bands like Love and the Grassroots, Leaves, a lot of local L.A. bands. Actually, we wound up dancing with Three Dog Night, too, and a lot of people. And we wore skimpy little clothes, and we were young, pretty teenagers, and everybody wanted us around. So uh, we met, a lot of us met on the strip, just wandering around, and a whole bunch of us met at Vito's house. Vito was a wild, crazy artist slash dancer. He had previously been a beatnik, and he followed whatever scene could get him to the young chicks. And that's how I met a lot of the girls, who later became the GTOs, Miss Lucy uh, and Miss Christine. And Miss Christine was Moon Zappa's governess. She was six months old. So I have, was already a huge fan of Frank's. To me, he represented all that was wild and crazy. I didn't want to be a hippie. I didn't want to be a flower child. I fit right in with the freaks because I wanted to blow minds in whatever way I possibly could. So Miss Christine took us up to meet Frank, and I was just beside myself. Sparky and I, and Miss Lucy already knew him from New York. So. So we all were hanging out up there, and he was getting such a kick out of us. We were dancing for him and twirling around and just being very excessively who we were. And he just enjoyed it, you know. <laughs> and he invited us to dance with the mothers. With each member of the troupe taking the title Miss before their name, an idea that was inspired by the novelty performer Tiny Tim. The Laurel Canyon Ballet Company already had a distinctive group identity when they first began dancing with the mothers in 1968. Yet Zappa saw in them greater potential and proposed that they transform into a band. And they became known as Girls Together Outrageously, or more popularly as the acronym, the GTOs. I remember it happening one day at Frank's house, you know, he just, just he said, you guys should be a group because, you know, he had just started his own label and it had never entered my mind, any of our minds, to be a group. It was completely Frank's idea to turn this group of girls into the GTOs. Well, they were interested in the music business anyway, so I said, why don't you sing? And I encouraged them to form a semi-singing performing group that would allow them a vehicle through which to express the, the things that they were doing ordinarily on the street. Uh, they were together as a group of people who just hung around together and had their own uh, ingrown folklore and philosophy and theology and you know, they were just seemed sort of a one mind type operation and I thought it would be nice to give people in the outside world that is w uh, outside the boundaries of Laurel Canyon some idea of what was going on with these girls and show the way that they were thinking. So Frank said, you know, you guys should start writing songs. I'm going to go away on the road and we're going to record you when we get home. So right around that same time, Mercy walked through the door. She'd just come down from San Francisco, and she was really outrageous looking, way more than we were. We were more ethereal, but Mercy looked like a gypsy with big raccoon eyes and, and just, just wild. And he pointed at her and said, she's also in the band. And we went, <gasps> well, we were kind of horrified at first, but... She and I became very, very close. And around that same time, Cinderella, I guess Mercy brought Cinderella over to the house, over to the cabin. So now there were seven of us, and Frank said, do these songs, write 14 songs, and um, we'll record them when the mothers get back from the road. So we went on this mission down in that crazy basement where the bowling alley was, and we wrote these songs. The teachers of the GTOs were basically to be a, a girls' group, uh, without real, real vocal training, and to also get some of the cutest guys possible. That's my opinion of what it was. It was a, also a girl thing. One of the first, you know, before the Spice Girls or any, any of that, it was a, a girl thing. And these girls weren't simply drawn to each other through their dancing. Various members of the GTOs had first encountered each other on the Sunset Strip as part of the flourishing groupie scene 
And although women seeking sexual intimacy with the famous and the powerful was not a new phenomenon, since the British invasion exploded on American shores in the mid-60s, a subculture had quickly begun to develop. This had gone on undiscussed by the music press and by the musicians themselves, and central to Zappa's interest in documenting the GTOs was to make this scene public. The whole thing about sex and rock and roll was going through a tremendous change in the 60s. I mean, you, you begin with bands like the Beatles, who obviously had tremendous sex appeal. You know, there was never a dry seat left in the house and all that kind of stuff. But their public image was squeaky clean and they were promoted as such. It's only years later you start to get reports of, uh, you know, of, particularly of their behaviour in places like Australia, where that just women were being just like reeled in, you know, sort of one every ten minutes or something. As the 60s sort of moved on, I mean, obviously rock and roll basically moved from being variety and entertainment and emerged as an art form of its own. And as it did that, it became self-referential, as, as art forms inevitably do. So uh, part of the reference, of course, as a if you're writing about being in a rock and roll band, it's, it's not only being on the road, but it's, it's also about groupies. Zappa was particularly keen on bringing it out into the open because for him this was part of the rock and roll message, was, was free love and sex and uh, threesomes and foursomes and everything else, as a political statement rather than uh, just to get laid. Although, of course, you know, the idea of getting laid was also something he was very keen on. And um, In fact, he often had... Uh, uh, by you know, groupies living in the house. I mean, you know, Gail just put up with it. Uh, uh, although she started off as a groupie herself, so she said. The GTOs was, I suppose, the ultimate expression of this, in that he finally got an actual band of groupies and, and made them into the act itself. There was quite a scene. It was a massive scene, and everybody sort of loved each other. If you, you could, we gravitated to each other. It was just a, a natural thing. Yeah, you'd meet them on the strip, walking around. They dressed, they looked similar, you know. You would just want to hug them, you know. It was, it was a very special time. And we were a group of groupies. Not all of them were groupies, though. Just about half of us. Mercy and I and Christine, even though she pretended she wasn't, she only went out with rock guys. She was the frigid member of the group. She said she'd lay stiff like this while they made love to her. Um, <laughs> but Sparky was not a groupie. And Sandra was not a groupie. Cinderella was. And Miss Lucy, sort of on the fence. So it was about half and half. Half groupies, half and half. We're called a groupie group, but we all of us weren't. That's what everybody on that whole scene wanted to do. So they were in the studio with Frank. So that, to them, that was great. Well, Frank directed us with a baton. He, he loved our songs. He just cracked up. When Frank really enjoyed something, he would beat his knee. And I'm, he would just do this. He would laugh and shriek, and if you actually got Frank to beat his knee, you're, that was a great day. You wanted to please him. You really did want to please him. Plus, he was our mentor. I mean, he was going to take us to new heights. We were going to be one of the first all-girl groups to have our own record. We thought we were going to be able to tour with it. We got incredible musicians in there. Whoever was in town, it just so happened the Jeff Beck group was in town. So we invited them down. We, we hung out with whatever British group was in town. So they, we invited them down to the studio, and Frank put them to work. Doing the GTO's album, if I could go back, I would change some of the musicians up. And I would try harder. But I can't. So what we have is what we have. But when you have Jeff Beck and Ainsley Dunbar and Nicky Hopkins, Lowell George, and certain people, we had Grant Parsons come down, and nobody would let him play on the album. And I, I'm really upset about that still. But uh, basically, it meant something to me. It meant something to Pamela. I don't know what it meant to the rest of the girls, how serious they were, because I can't really, you know. But it was fun at the same time. It was, it was great to be able to say to the other guys, yeah, we're doing an album too, you know. Yet the fun times didn't last. In a familiar turn of events, an incident occurred that led to Zappa abandoning the project for a time. Halfway through the recording of the album, some of the girls got arrested in the GTOs, and Frank was very straight. He was very pissed off about this. So he dropped the record at that point. And we weren't even sure he was going to... For all we knew, it was over. The record was over. So a few months went by, and... He asked Sparky and I to come back into the studio, and this was a very good sign. So uh, that's why a lot of the album is just recited, because the rest of the girls weren't involved. It was Sparky and I. 
Released in December 69, Permanent Damage was a strangely disjointed LP, and despite its list of celebrity cameos, the finished album was both a commercial and a critical disappointment. Yet as a musical experience and an audio document, it was certainly unique. I was really proud of it, you know, it didn't matter that, I mean, some of the singing is not, you can't even call it singing, but it, like I said, it was more performance art before that even term even existed, so we know we, we were on the cutting edge of something. <laughs> so it was very exciting, and all the attention, you know, it was, it was wonderful. I remember being in the studio, and just loving it so much, saying, wow, I'm right in the middle of doing my own record, my own words I wrote. We wrote one about Don Van Vliet. The Captain's Fat Teresa Shoes that I, I think came out just great. I think it's a classic. <laughs> If you're aiming product at a rock consumer, I think the GTOs is an anti-album. I can't hear it as successful rock. To me, they sound like cheerleaders. It sounds like cheerleading culture. It's what girls sing on the bus. Like an audience with Wildman Fisher, however, the snippets of phone conversations and the recitals by Pamela and Sparky made the album more than a failed attempt at rock. It was a snapshot of a subculture and very much a work by Frank Zappa. He was fascinated with the tape recorder. He'd always taped his band in the dressing room. He'd always take them on the bus. He always, like, he's always running tapes and then including bits of that on the records. And so things don't have to be someone who's a very well-trained flautist playing the flute. And so on the GTO's record, you get guest appearances by Jeff Beck and Lal George and all these gods of rock. But you're still really waiting for one of the GTOs to say something because that's the, the meat of the, 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 the record is the, the charm and naivety of their voices. This one man had a drawn on mustache and um, he, he drove us all the way home from L.A. I couldn't believe it. And then when he, right, right after he dropped us off, he turned around and goes, ten dollars to eat it. And we went, ah! Now those are demented, those poor men. I feel so sorry for them. I could, oh my God. It's brilliant, actually. I think it really freezes a little moment in time of, of the Laurel Canyon groupie rock and roll scene in the late 60s. It's, it's, it's just as good as performance, shall we say, about London in the late 60s, except that was a film. So, um, I, I think it's an underestimated record, except possibly musically, which is not very interesting. But as a, a sociological document and a piece of music uh, history, it's great. Self. Alice Cooper was born, at first signifying the band, and shortly afterwards lead singer Vincent Fernier himself. And slowly they would transform into an outrageous blend of horror and rock. The newly named outfit were becoming an infamous fixture on the L.A. live circuit, an audition for many labels, yet were struggling to find a record company brave enough to sign them. It was one of the GTOs, Miss Christine, who in the end provided the vital connection that got the band noticed by Zappa. We did stand out in a crowd, even in L.A., which is a pretty crazy place to say the least. You know, we could still get attention. Um, and so just through, through our friends, through word of mouth, whatever, um, Alice had, uh, had met Miss Christine, they, they kind of hit it off, and uh, so she had come to, one, and the GTOs had come to one or two of our shows. She was the babysitter for Frank Zappa and, and, Moon, and Baby Moon Unit at the time. So she had a great in with Frank, and she told him uh, all about our band. We would hike up the hill, Alice and I, and go over to visit Miss Christine, and who was uh, Moon Unit's babysitter. And so the three of us would watch uh, Moon Unit crawl around the floor while Alice and I tried to talk uh, Miss Christine into getting Frank to come and hear our band play, uh, which uh, she nearly did two or three times, and then it would fall through at the last minute. As a matter of fact, one time Frank even showed up, and, but he had to leave before we played. So this time, Miss Christine made the mistake of saying that Frank was going to be home late that night. And that, so we said, okay, we're coming over tomorrow. And she said, oh no, Frank doesn't like people to come over to the house. And so we talked her into agreeing that nine o'clock we would come over, but she would talk to Frank and then let us know if it wasn't okay. Well, 
By the time we walked all the way back to Topanga Canyon, Alice had turned 9 p.m. into 9 a.m. So we showed up at 9 o'clock in the morning, knocked on the door. Miss Christine opened the door in total shock, and we barged our way in with all of our equipment and everything and set up outside of Frank's uh, bedroom. About a couple of songs in, the door opened, and all we saw is Frank's hand come out, motion us to stop. And then when we stopped, he stuck his head out and said, let me have some coffee and then I'll listen. And so we played six songs, well, probably not six. We did a, a couple of songs for him and, and then he stopped us and said, I like it. Like we were kindred spirits because in LA at the time, there were two distinct types of young people. There were hippies and there were freaks. Well, we weren't either one, uh, the Alice Cooper group, but uh, we definitely related more to the freaks. And Zappa and the GTOs were definitely representative of that. The GTOs were about as crazy as a uh, band could be. Wildman Fisher was uh, bonafide crazy, and uh, there was no doubt in anybody's mind about that. Captain Beefheart wasn't your, you know, Pat Boone of the day. Uh, so. So we fit right in. We were definitely on the bizarre side, and that was the name of the record label. So we thought we were perfect, and, and evidently uh, Frank did as well. He introduced these bands and bizarre records to the public as one homogenous collective, and in early December booked a show at the Shrine Exposition Hall. With the mothers headlining, Easy Chair, the GTOs, Alice Cooper, and Wild Band Fisher all performed at the historic event. It would be the first and last time that these label mates played on the same bill. We had written the material for the album and Frank came home and asked us to perform with the Mothers and Alice Cooper. We were beside ourselves. I mean, it was such a thrill, really nervous though. I mean, we were just girls and we didn't know what we were doing, but he did get us a rehearsal hall, Lindy Opera House in Hollywood, where a lot of other bands were rehearsing. We saw some cool people there, but we rehearsed like crazy we really got it down as far as down as anybody you know could get it how nutty it was but we had prop lots of props and i sang a song called the oo man which is on the album and i sang to a big fake snowman and it was about nick st nicholas my crush at the moment and he was there in the audience and i remember just being so embarrassed and wondering what he would think and all that i thought it went really well i wish somebody had filmed it 